So y'all say this with me. These are the two most important hours of our week. Help me to cherish them. I'm here today to worship, not to be entertained. I'm singing to an audience of one, except I worship, oh Lord. Give Lord a hand clap for God.
seed. Everything you say is a seed. The Bible says you read what you sow. Your voice is a seed. Your attitude is a seed. But right now we're talking about the seed that's in your hand. If you take this seed and you don't plant it, this is all you ever have. But once you take the seed and give it to God, then God gives a harvest.
got this. Somebody can say, God's got this. <laughs> That's right. God's got it. All right. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Yes. Sure is been warm lately. <laughs> Has anybody noticed that? <laughs> if you haven't noticed that, you need some medicine. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Uh, I was reminded this week of a story I heard. <laughs> a few years back, there was uh, three friends decided to go deer hunting together. One was a lawyer, one was a doctor, and the other was a preacher. They were walking along, and uh, as they were walking along came a great big old buck, so the three of them shot simultaneously. Immediately, the buck dropped to the ground, and all three rushed up to see how big it actually was. Upon reaching it, they found out that it was dead, but it only had one bullet hole in the head. There was a big debate followed concerning whose buck it was. A few minutes later, a game officer came by, and uh, a game warden asked what was the problem, and the doctor said that, uh, I told him the reason for the debate, and the officer said he would take a look, and he would tell them who shot the buck. Within a few seconds, the game warden said with much confidence, the pastor shot the buck. And he said, well, how did you see that? Easy, he said, the bullet went in one ear and out the other. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Don't let today go in one ear and out the other. Amen? We're, we're, uh, I, we're still going on this, and we might have one more week of this. Uh, that is running on fumes. Running on fumes. I, I like it sometimes. If you send me a text message and I don't answer quite right, <laughs> right back to big old question mark. Because sometimes I read the read it so fast that I read the, the it's just it's the ADHD kicking in. I read the last of it or the first of it and lose the rest of it, and, and so I have to go back and read it again later on and go, oh man. <laughs> so so y'all let me know. Uh, it happened several times yesterday. So so I'm going to go and tell you ahead of time. ADHD is your friend and your, your best friend and your worst enemy. All right. Okay, so get your Bible out. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19, stand for the reading of the word. 1 Kings chapter 19. If you love God, say amen. Amen. All right. And they, verse 1, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, y'all say that when he saw that. When he saw Somebody that. will say, He ain't looking good. <laughs> He went for his life and came to Bathsheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey in the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, There's enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. Wow. The man is running for his life, and when he stops, he asks God to take his life. That is a classic example of running on empty, running on fumes. Ask the church for your hands this way. Father, we love you, Lord. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We know, God, that you are alive and well, and you are on the throne. I ask you right now, Lord, to minister to us and through us right now. Help us to see, to know, to understand that you are here with us and that there is nothing impossible for you. I ask you right now, Lord, to bless your word. Let it go out in a very powerful way. Bless us as we listen to your word. And Lord, we know, Lord, that today this service is not a monologue. It's a dialogue between us and the Lord. And I thank you for it right now in the name of Jesus. And the church said, Amen. 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 You be seated away now. Tell somebody, look, tell somebody that passes behind us. The future is ahead of us. God is with us. And nothing shall be impossible. Go ahead and sit down. All right. Again, I'm just going to quickly, quickly go through a few slides uh, from last week, and then we're going to jump right in 
to this week. Um, of course, we're talking about running on fumes. Have you ever been running on fumes? You doing everything. I've been like that down riding down the road, doing everything I can to get that keep that thing from hitting empty. Amen. Get me to the gas station. Please get me to the gas station while I, before I have to walk. Amen. And so, so, so here it is. Survey asked, and it's going to be quick. I'm going to get through this quick. Uh, have you ever gone as far as you can go? You, you can raise your hand. Don't have to. It's all right. Have you ever gone as far as you can go? Have you taken all you can take? Have you given all you can give? Welcome to running on fumes. Amen. You're running on empty. There's a Jackson Brown that sang that song. Uh, running on empty. You're running on empty. You're running on fumes. God's got something going on, amen, in your life. And you just got to see it. Because remember, when you're running on fumes, it's really hard to see it. Because once you start running on fumes, you are mentally, you are physically, and you are spiritually exhausted. Now, again, I'm just going to go over some of these quickly. Uh, there's, a, there's a modern day Elijah sitting under the juniper tree. That there's a danger of running on fumes because fumes lead to burnout. And burnout creates brokenness, and brokenness drives depression. Now, I talked about it last week. I don't want to dwell on it, but when you get run on fumes, pretty soon the tank gets empty and you burn out. And once you burn out, it starts clogging up all kinds of stuff. Some engines will not even start back again without special help after it has been burned out. It becomes broken, and brokenness drives depression, and you just kind of lay down and play dead. Uh, look at all the stuff that's going on around us, the election year, and, and now it's got so politicized, it's almost impossible now to even pick out what's going on without wondering, is there any kind of slant by a politician on all of this? And so, again, uh, it's the year of the perfect storm. There was a global pandemic, global unrest, and everybody's got personal challenges. We have to wonder, is it safe to go places? Is it safe to get around people? Uh, when I get around somebody, I'm supposed to be wearing a mask. You know, uh, am I wearing my mask? All kinds of stuff. You get people beside you, they're not wearing their mask in, in a grocery store, and, and you want to get away from them. Uh, it just because you watch everything that's going on and, and, and the way the deaths keep coming. You know, somebody even says, this is all a great big hoax. Well, I'm going to tell you what. So many people, I wish they probably, they, they probably wish they'd known it was a hoax before they died. It's not a hoax. But some of the stuff is played up. That's the difference. There is a real thing, but now it's being politicized, and so it's kind of hard to figure everything out because of all the, the politics involved. So here's where I let you last week. Here's Elijah. He's under the juniper tree. We're going to do it fast. Uh, he was, in, in the 18th chapter, he was on a spiritual high. He was running on these emotions. His adrenaline was flowing because he was on a spiritual high. Then by the time he gets to where we just read, now he's on a spiritual low because uh, now he's running again, but this time he's running for his life. And now he's not running on emotions of, of uh, excitement, but now he's running on emotions of fear. And pretty soon when he gets to the tree, the juniper tree, now he's just run out of gas. He's spiritually exhausted. Now, now, now I've been there. I don't know about you. Some of y'all, if you've never been there, uh, adjust your halo. <laughs> okay, just go ahead and adjust it. Because I can tell you, there's times that we have spiritual highs, and then there's times there's spiritual lows, and there's times where we're spiritually exhausted. And sometimes it can be in the same hour. Okay? Especially if you're in a crisis. If you're in a crisis or a loss, you can go through all three of one time. It's not very hard to do, but it seems like it's hard to get out of the spiral. So, so let's just kind of go back over what we just read and kind of dissect it, okay? Uh, I, I broke it down for you last week, but not like I'm going to break it down today. What happened to Elijah, the very powerful man of God, one of the greatest Old Testament prophets? He, he, was, he was the Old Testament version of John the Baptist. He, he hold no holds barred. He was the man. I mean, he, he got things done. People were, they were scared to death of him. Because here comes this man that, that, that is very powerful in the Lord. But after all the things he done, in a matter of minutes. Somebody say minutes. minutes. In a matter of minutes, he went from the high to the low to exhaustion. Wow. Wow. Y'all say wow. wow. I mean, here's the man, the myth, the legend. 
And now he's done run on him and he's run out. So first thing he did, watch this now. Did this, we're going to break her down. We're going to break it down good, hopefully. Y'all watch this now. The first thing is the, the, the key to Elijah's fumes, okay? It kind of set a little kind of play on words, the key to the fumes. The key to Elijah's fumes when he saw that. We just read it, when he saw that. Remember I said he wasn't good looking? He wasn't looking good. He wasn't looking good. In chapter 18, he wasn't paying attention. He wasn't paying attention. He was paying attention to God. He had his eyes on God. But just like Peter when he's walking on the water, he's walking on the water as long as he's looking at Jesus. But as soon as he got his eyes on the storm, he began to sink. Matthew chapter 14. So the very first thing Elijah did was, when he saw that, he changed his focus. He ceased to walk by faith. He was walking by faith. He'd been running by faith. Amazing what had been going on in this man's life. But just the thought of what Jezebel said she was going to do to him, after taking on 850 prophets, after taking on the whole nation, one person, one person, y'all say one person. One person. You can be going through 25 things in your life. You can be going through 100 things in your life. And one thing take you down. PTSD, combat PTSD. It's not for being over there two years, three years, four years. It can only be, listen, all it's got to be is from one event. One event. You're going through hundreds of events every day, especially those in the special forces and those that are on frontline combat. They go through hundreds of things every day. But when they get, how to get the PTSD is usually from one event. One event. Can I say that enough? One event. Okay? So, so again, here, here it goes. And they really did event over and over and over again. So here he is. He ceased to walk by faith. When he saw that, he, he changed his focus. Let me ask you a question now. If you're, and, and, and we all there. We all get there. We all go there. This is not, um, if, if you say, well, I can't say to myself I've been there because everybody think I'm weak. No, everybody. Elijah, one of the most powerful men in the Bible, he changed his focus. He ceased to walk by faith for a moment, a moment, a moment. And when he saw that, he changed his focus. And once he changed his focus, that changed his force. Because the Bible says he went from boldness, taking on 850 prophets, and now I can't even take on this one challenge. He went from boldness to fear. And the Bible says he arose and went for his life. I want you just again, I, I want to stop right here and dwell on it because I want you to think about it. Sometimes you say, well, I, I, I don't want to appear weak. It's not necessarily that you're weak because you could have fought 10 things, 20 things, 100 things. You could be going through all kinds of things and stand strong and all it takes is one thing. One. One. Not a bunch. One. One thing hits you the wrong way one thing come across in a different kind of way, a different kind of challenge, and all of a sudden, after you're thinking, we got all this taken care of, and God, you're awesome, and we can't, we just love you, God, everything's cool, and then, where'd you go, God? One thing. Just one. So, so he, he, he changed his focus, he changed his force, and of course, then he changed his feelings. Now he becomes depressed. He burned out. I mean, burned out, burned out. He came to Bathsheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. He's all by himself, and he goes and he gets under the juniper tree. I can promise you, let me just play it again, you just last week could have gone through thing after thing after thing, problem after problem after problem, challenge after challenge after challenge, and you came through with shining colors. You stood strong. God had your back. You knew he had your back. You were doing some amazing things. And then one challenge, just one, can take you down. That one challenge will, will, will cause you to take your eyes off of the goal and put your eyes on the problem. So you lose your focus. Once you get your eyes off the goal and get your eyes on the, on the problem, then you will lose your force. You'll begin to go from boldness to fear. And then you will lose because you start going by your feelings. So, so, so here we go. We're going to talk about the five uh, well, here we go. Let's get this going here. I'm going to try to show you. The five life drainers in Elijah's life. 
the five life drainers uh, in Elijah's life. Look at that. Down the fumes. Anybody here ever been down the fumes? <laughs> Amen. I, I, I can tell you that everybody in here, I'm going to go ahead and make it easy for you. There's probably at least one time a week everybody is running on fumes. Okay? I'm going to make it easy for you. Running on fumes is not a sign of weakness. Running on fumes is a signal. It's like a fever is a signal. Something's wrong. A headache is a signal. Something is wrong. When you get your car and you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you get a little blinking light and it says check engine. Okay? Check engine. Ho, ho, ho. Has anybody ever called that a dummy light? Yeah. Okay, you know what? You're only a dummy if you don't check it. There's a sign. There's a reason. There's something about it. The same way in our life, we get going, and as we're going, all of a sudden the lights on the dash flashing. We got the headache. We might have the, the fever. We got something going, a uh, bellyache, and, and, and we don't realize that we're getting ready to be running on fumes. And next thing you know, we're snapping at people. Next thing you know, we're snapping at ourselves. Next thing you know, we're not, we're not worshiping God. We're worried about fine. Look, I, I don't even know, realize I got to even find the gas station because right to start with, you might even realize you're running on fumes. So here it is. I'm going to help you find out when you run on fumes. All right, ready? Let's get ready. Number one, Elijah faced physical exhaustion. All right, get ready. You talk about somebody having an awesome time in the Lord. How many ever had one of those services where you know, where you just felt like you could jump all over the top of all the pews, you could swing from the chandeliers. You know, I, I had one of the guys that trained me, he said he was sitting in this, he had a church running like oh, 500, he's sitting there and he said the evangelist got there and he said the spirit got moving, and he said, uh, I felt like I could just jump up and swing off that chandelier, and, and the pastor said, I'd like to see that myself. <laughs> the guy said, I said, I felt like it, I weren't going to do it. <laughs> okay. So, so, so watch this. Here's what's happened in chapter 18. Watch this. Now, 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 it's intense. Some of our lives get intense. Last week, uh, last Sunday, like I told you, and I'm not saying, oh, poor pitiful me at all, at all. I'm just trying to put some, put a picture on the words in my own life. Just last week, uh, uh, I get a call on Friday that we're gonna, they, need, they need somebody to go help bury a four-week-old child. So on Saturday, I spent hours talking with the family. And then on Sunday, I go and, and, and uh, bury that four-week-old child. And, and then uh, within hours, it seemed like, it was the following it was Tuesday morning at 4 o'clock in the morning, D.C. calls. And, and my deceased wife's father, my first father-in-law, had died. And so I get up, and I go, and I stay there until like 8 or 8 in the morning. So I was there for four or five hours. And I even, and, and I even helped... Uh, uh, take him out of the house. And so, so again, uh, the intensity just kept going and going and going. And then something else happened and somebody called me and they were going to have this tragedy and somebody else was going through their own, own need to talk and to, to get it out of their system. And, and, and all of a sudden I wound up ministering to the guys of B5 and they had their own problems and then I ministered to people uh, in other places that, that were having some major problems. And, 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 and you know what? If you carry it, you're going to burn out. If you carry all this on your shoulders, you're going to burn out. You're going to be on fumes quick. But even if you haven't been on fumes, you, you've got, you're not carrying it on your shoulders. Watch this now. First, he goes down there. Israel is now gone crazy. Uh, Israel has lost all of its sins. The God that they served, the God who got them where they were, now all of a sudden God is not even God anymore. They wouldn't do it their way. I know you haven't heard anything like that lately. Right. Okay? I mean, this is kind of a picture of the day, too. You know, if we put God in this, we could have this cleaned up pretty quick. But we're not putting God in it. And we got people's feelings, and everybody's got different, uh, different things going on. So instead of incorporating the Word, we're just incorporating how we feel. And I can promise you, every last one of us feel different about everything. Okay? 
So, so, so Elijah comes in and, and challenges the prophets of Baal to a showdown. He builds the altar, and I don't want to get into too much, but he builds the altar, and he lets them try to get their God to, to, to and this is an all-day thing. This is all day. He lets them try to get their God to answer, and he does it. Hit, and then when he prays a 63-word prayer, <clears throat> After he rebuilt the altar of God, they poured water on it three times and put a trench around it. I mean, the man's working hard. Built a trench around it, uh, uh, put barrels, uh, uh, barrels of water on the altar and does it three times. And then, then he calls out fire from heaven with 63 word prayer and it burns up the, altar, the sacrifice and the altar and laps it all up. He laps up the stones. So this is some pretty exciting stuff. Then he turns around, he's on the mountaintop. He comes down from the mountaintop and goes in the valley and takes the 450 prophets plus the 400 prophets of the grove, 850 prophets, false prophets, and he kills them down below. Then he goes back up and climbs the mountain again. Anybody ever climbed the mountain? Okay, so he's been, he climbed the mountain to build the altar. He comes down to kill the prophets. He goes back up to the, and starts praying for rain. And so while he's praying for rain, uh, he's praying and, and he sends, his, sends his, his assistant out seven times and they find the cloud, the cloud the cloud the size of a man's hand. So he tells Ahab to get down from the mountain and get home because it's getting ready to be a gully washer. So now he's going up the mountain, down the mountain. Up the mountain, down the mountain. Some of you said while he was praying, it was multiple times in that. So he's up the mountain, down the mountain, up the mountain, down the mountain. The man has to be around 60 years old or older. And so I know, I don't, I, I'm 60. And I have discovered that the older I get, the better I was. Okay? And so, so, so here he is. He, he, he does his thing. Now uh, Ahab is going to take his prized chariot, which had four to six stallions that pulled his chariot, and he had to run 18 to 20 miles. He girds up his loins, or pulls up his skirt, and he outruns four to six of the best horses in the land. He outruns them. Outruns them to the pilots. Can you imagine running 20 miles outrunning two, four to six horses? So the man is just, he's just got it going on. Now, so, <clears throat> Now, he gets there and is a gully washer. And then Ahab tells his wife what went on. She says, I'm going to kill him tomorrow. Why, after all that stuff he did, remember, whenever you get a chance, whenever you think about beating yourself up because one thing got you down, remember, look at all the good things that man did. And one thing got So here he's physically exhausted. So when you're physically exhausted, you can expect something to, to, to not, not, not be so great. Okay? Not only was he physically exhausted, he was emotionally exhausted because he was on a roller coaster now. He, he, he's, he, he's, he's, he's running for his life. When he gets where he's going, he asks God to take his life. So he's up and he's down. He's up and he's down. Nobody in here has had that experience, have you? <laughs> Not, you mean, I'm going to do your thing. You mean today? That's how Benny always says, you mean today? Yeah. Uh, uh, here he is. I'm running for my very life, but then God take me. I don't know how to just kill me. Wait a minute. If you wanted God to kill you, stay there and let Jezebel do it. She was ready to go. She had the life in hand. <laughs> that emotional roller coaster. These are these are these are life trainers. These are when you push your own fumes only. You're physically exhausted. You are emotionally exhausted. Then there's social exhaustion. I know everybody just loves to be around people all the time, don't you? Everybody just loves to be around people all the time. Especially people that have all the answers. Or people that have everything. Or they'll tell you, you don't know nothing. Here it is. Watch this. Social exhaustion. He confronted 850 prophets, and now he's being confronted by Jezebel's social exhaustion. And then he had spiritual exhaustion. Now these are the five life trainers. 
If you find yourself physically exhausted, emotionally exhausted, socially exhausted, or find yourself spiritually exhausted, then you're going to find out that you're in a bad fix because now, the, 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 the now he's now playing his own work. He says, "I'm not even." He tells God, "says Well, everything I've done has been for nothing. I've worked for you, God, and everything I've done has been for nothing. I'm no better than the guys that were going against you." And then he exaggerated the situation. Wow. Wow. And so now he gives in. And when he gives in, I know I said I had five there. Guess what? Number five is he just give in to it all. No longer is he going to fight it. He's going to give in and say, stay me. Again, let me ask that question. How many times have you found yourself there? Physical exhaustion, emotional exhaustion, social exhaustion, and actually social exhaustion, you can add in relationship conflicts, and spiritual exhaustion, and you just finally just, you're just exhausted and you give in. So, so watch this. Ready? Ready? And we're getting ready to, we're getting ready to slow this down and end it, because we're going to finish it up next week. Because a whole lot to bite off. Why does God, a great God, a powerful God, an all-knowing God, an all-seeing God, allow us to get to this point? It happened to his apostles at the death of Christ. It happened to Paul multiple times. It happened to Jonah. It happened to Moses. It happened to Joshua. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure you can find this actually happened to just about anybody that's got their name recorded in the Bible, even the mighty Joseph. Why does God allow us to come to this point? Why doesn't he stop it dead in his tracks? Why doesn't he just change things? That's all he's got to do. It's over. Why does he allow it? Number one, he allows it. Because he is pointing us to the power of the cross. Elijah, in verse chapter 18, was all about looking at God. He had his eyes on God. He was watching God. He had God leading him, guiding him, directing him. When he got in verse chapter 19, it was no longer about all looking at God. Now it was all looking in the mirror. Wow. That one event changed him from looking up to looking down, from looking out to looking in. I've been there and said, you know, there must be something wrong with me. Obviously there's something wrong with me for me to be feeling this way. Obviously, I've done something. No. What I did was, is I took my eyes off the goal and got my eyes on the problem. You know why you do that? Because walking by faith is harder than it looks. Trusting God when everything's falling apart around you is hard. Matter of fact, it's harder. It's probably one of the hardest battles you'll ever fight is taking your hands off and then God fix it. Steve told me, another guy pastoring in Benson told me, 
and another guy, uh, three pilots, all three pilots told me, all three told me, said, when you mess up and your plane goes in a tailspin, he says, they told us, unless you're in a fighter jet and you've been shot, I'm talking about this plane, oh, you messed up and you're in a tailspin, take your hand off the stick. Because if you try to hold that stick and try to fix it, you will crash and burn. Let go of the stick. The plane is designed to correct itself. The instruments. Trust the building of it. Sometimes we've taken our eyes off the goal. We've got our eyes on the problem. And we got the stick. We're in a tailspin. And we're trying to do everything we can to make it right. And all we do is make it worse. When we get to this point, God says, okay, now you can look to the power of the cross. Because you need his help. Number two, it brings a message of grace and mercy to a life. Now it's personal. I'm not. I'm not just looking over there at somebody else going. Have you ever done that before? Remember, remember to tell you. I've told y'all hundreds of times about the time I was, I was at, I was at food line, and I'd always see people lose their cart. They'd be going all over the place in the parking lot, and I'd laugh at them. Say, who could be that? Who could be that? That empty headed to lose your car in the parking lot. And so one day I was in there and I had my car behind me and I was full of groceries and shot the windy and I'm putting my groceries in the car and I look beside me and there's a cart and it's picking up speed. Nobody's in, it's full of groceries and it's getting ready to go out on the highway. And I said, What dummy did that? I said, That's okay, I got to, I got to get back to what I was doing. I turned around. And there was nothing there. <laughs> it was my cart. Woo! I had to chase it across the parking lot before it hit the highway. <laughs> but, you know, we look at people and go, how can they get their eyes off the goal? How can they have one thing get the best of them? Don't they know we've been through hundreds of things before and everything's okay? God always come through. But now that one thing hit them, that one challenge came to, across their desk. That one thing, that, that one problem, maybe it's a medical problem or, or some death or, or something. That one problem came and then you were a spiritual giant and, 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 and before you had it happen to you, you looked at other people and said, how can they let that get them down? And then it happened to you. Okay? Then I realized, you know what? We all need grace. We all need mercy. And we all need now to give it to you. Okay? Because it's personal now. Number three, it, it, it prompts reliance upon him and others. You can't do it alone. It's impossible. you got to have help. You can walk around like Superman if you want to and think you don't need any help. And those guys, we, you know, we, how many guys are going to say, I can do it? you got to sit in the house. I can do this. Yeah, we need to move the piano in, 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 out in the barn. I can do it. All by myself. Really? Have you seen the BN? Or, or uh, I need to take an engine out of my car. I can do it all by myself. You've got a voice though, but I can take it out. Really? We don't realize. Sometimes we don't rely enough on other people. I, I, I will go in the morning to be five, and I can promise you there will be one or two guys tell me if I had just relied on somebody else, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be in the shape I was in. And also, it shows us and it shows others we can still be used. Even in the worst situations, God wants you to move beyond guilt to usefulness. Again. Y'all say that with me out loud. God wants us to move from guilt to usefulness again. Wow. This stuff happens. First off, we look at other people and, and we say, how can they do that? And all of a sudden, it's us now. Guilt's okay. There's a difference in guilt and shame. Guilt actually is productive. Guilt will actually is productive and it leads you to constructive change. It leads you to go into God in prayer. It leads you to, to make sure things are done different. Shame is different. Shame is the results of it. And you don't want to be seen. You don't want to be heard. You don't want to know it. You don't even see you. You want to be like a, a bug in the rug, hid. But guilt's different. Guilt is productive. Shame is counterproductive. 
God wants us to move beyond that guilt of falling to this again or falling for this. You see, and guys, I'll come here and get replaced on There's another Elijah. There's Elijah under the juniper tree, out of gas, needing help. Does that describe you? Just, just quickly, just, 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 just want you to think about it. Does that describe you? Have you ever been there? Look, watch this. Has your life of faith become a life of fear? Has your life of faith become a life of fumes? Remember this. God sees you and he has never left you. Everybody stand. The tomb is empty so that you don't have to be. The tomb is empty so you don't have to be. Y'all say that. Say this. Say this. The tomb is empty so that I don't have to be.
beyond guilt unto usefulness. God is awesome all the time. And God wants to use you, every last one of you. No matter what you feel, it's not got to do with feeling. It's got to do with being used. And the one thing, look at this, that one thing that may have got you down will be the one thing he also, God uses to propel you to minister to somebody else. Because once you've been through this, there's something within you now that you have the ability to minister to somebody else going through the same thing. And they think of the same thing that they can't get beyond it. You can tell them, yes, you can. I know you can. Because God is the man. He helped me. He's going to help you.